let's go ahead and uh, flip over to chapter four, page 44, We Agnostics, if you haven't done so already. This entire chapter is devoted to step two. Step one says that we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And if we are powerless, then obviously power has to be our answer. If insanity is what is driving me out the door due to thinking that is created by self, then obviously sanity must be the answer. So the book says, chapter four, we acknowledge but the step itself reads, we came to believe that a power. Notice it doesn't say that we come to believe in a power. Now, a lot of people get that confused in here. They think we come in and we have to believe in something or else. And we're kind of taught that from the time we were small. But everything that I believed in up to this point hasn't worked. <laughs> it's worked for a little while, but at some point, I've become insane again. So it says we come to believe that a power, not in a power greater than self to restore me to sanity. So the words we came is past tense. We came to that a long time ago. So in the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. That should be a question mark. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non. Remember, they gave us several descriptions of the non-alcoholic. And they gave us several descriptions of the alcoholic. <clears throat> if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Now that's because of the mental obsession. Or if when drinking, you have little amount control over the amount you take. That's because of the physical allergy. Then you're probably alcoholic. In that case, you may be suffering from an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Now, we're not talking about drinking. We're talking about insanity of the mind that drives us to drink, drug, use, do the other things we do. That's what we're looking to recover from here. So people tell me all the time, David, do you think I'm alcoholic? And I say, I don't know. Let me ask you two questions. Turn to page 44 with me. They'll open up the book. We'll look at this. I'll ask them this question. If when you honestly want to, have you found that you cannot quit entirely? If they answer yes to that, I say, or if when drinking, do you have little control over the amount you take? And if they say yes to that, then I would say, well, you're probably alcoholic, according to this book. So <clears throat> I'd hate to think that Abby went to Bill with 44 questions like we hear today. Let's do 44 questions to find out if you're an alcoholic. My book only asks two, and it's that right there. The one who feels, key word, feels, he is an atheist or an agnostic. Such an experience seems impossible, but to continue as it means, is means disaster, especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death, that's step one. Or to live on a spiritual basis, that's step two. Are not always easy alternatives to face, and the reason is I don't know how. I, I have a glimpse of what an alcoholic death looks like, but I haven't had that. And I'm not spiritually awake, so I don't really know what that looks like. They kind of look like the same when I'm in that state of mind. But it isn't so difficult. About half of our original fellowship, that's 50 of the first 100, that's half, were of exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. <laughs> that's kind of how self does. Well, let's hope this isn't true. But after a while, I have to face the fact. And I'm going to find that again in inventory. It's going to be a fact-facing process. That we must find a spiritual basis of life or else perhaps it's going to be that way with you to cheer up something like half of us, keyword, thought we were atheists or agnostic. Doesn't mean we were. We thought we were. And when I think I'm something, I act as if I'm something until I think differently. Then I don't act that way anymore. So if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. Now, all of this philosophical stuff, I'll come in and hear all these guys talk about all this philosophy and all these codes. The word code just means principles. 
If you look it up in the Webster Dictionary, that's all it means is principles. And I try to use all of this stuff to save me. I'll go and I'll, I want all of this deep thinking and all this, you know, all this high guru and talk to me with all of this. And I fall out. Now, this is very good stuff to have after the spiritual awakening. I can apply this. And it's very good. But not before. It says it did not save us. <laughs> That's pretty powerful words. No matter how much we tried, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all of our might. But see, the needed power wasn't there. See, that's what I've lost. I've lost power. The power to choose, remember? Our human resources, and that's even talking about the fellowship, has carried me as far as it's going to be able to. As marshaled by the will, there's self again. It's not sufficient. It fails utterly. So here it is. Lack of power. Not lack of belief. Not lack of trust. Not lack of faith. Not lack of this and any of that. Lack of power. That's my dilemma. That's what the hell's wrong with me. I lack the power to make the right decision whenever it comes to areas of my life that are destructive. It says we have to find a power by which we can live, and that has to be a power greater than self, obviously. But where how are we to find this power? Well, that was my question. Where am I going to find this power? Well, look at what it says. It's exactly what the book's about. See, it doesn't say that's what our meetings are for. That doesn't say, well, that's what my sponsor's all about. No, that's exactly what the book is about. The main object is to enable you to find a power greater than self, which will solve your problem, not help you solve it, not send you somewhere to solve it. Hope like hell me and my sponsor can solve it. No. Connect back to the power greater than self. I take the word your, my, our, anything off of self. I don't associate with that anymore. A power greater than self, and it will solve my problem. That's a promise. Probably the greatest promise in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want my problem solved. See, my problem's not drugs. My problem's not alcohol. My problem's not lust. It's not any of that shit. It's the mind that drives me to do that over and over and over. That's the problem. And it tells me here that's going to be, I'm going to be relieved of that. So that means we've written a book to which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, we're going to talk about God. Here difficulty arises with agnostics. Many times a new, we talk to a new man and watch his hope rise as we discuss our alcoholic problems and explain our fellowship. <clears throat> but his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters, especially when we mention God. Or we have reopened a subject which our man, key word right here, thought he had neatly invaded or entirely ignored. It's amazing how those thoughts just come at me book says we know how it feels. We've shared his honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. The others, the word God brought up a particular key word right here, idea. Remember, that's where self is, of him, which someone tried to impress him during childhood. So perhaps we rejected this particular conception. There it is again, because it seemed inadequate. With that rejection, we imagine. See, there's the problem. I imagine that I abandoned the God idea entirely. I did not. I did not. It was just covered up, glossed over. I couldn't see it anymore. All right. <clears throat> Top 46. We're going to look at the first reflection exercise in this chapter. We're bothered with the thought, and I'm always bothered with some thoughts. How about y'all? That faith and dependence upon a power beyond self is somewhat weak, even cowardly. We look upon this world of warring individuals, warring theological systems, the inexplicable calamity, and deep skepticism. Don't tell me I'm not a thinker. Don't tell me I'm not a meditator. I used to smoke a lot of weed. And, uh, I could get with the stars for a little bit, you know? We look asking at many individuals who claim to be godly. Oh, man, I used to just tear them up. How could a supreme being have anything to do with this at all? And then other moments we found ourselves thinking and that's dangerous when enchanted by a starlit night who then made all this it was a feeling of awe and wonder but it was fleeting and soon lost now this is a reflection exercise in our big book when i take man through this process of the work we stop right here and i have them reflect on this has there ever been a time in your life when you were in absolute awe of something absolute peace just even for a minute I can remember standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon in 2010 and looking over and saying, this is 
coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm looking at this massive hole in the earth, and it's just like, wow. And the next thought that come in, you get too close to the edge of that damn thing, you're going to fall off, and it's a long way down to the bottom. So that experience right there. It was gone. That's what he says here. We found ourselves thinking when enchanted by a starlit night, who then made there was a feeling of awe and wonder like there was for me on the Grand Canyon. It was fleeting and soon lost. Why? Because in thoughts itself will come back in and rob me of that experience. That's a reflection exercise. Look at that sometimes. <clears throat> Bottom paragraph, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Thank God for this. Our own conception, however adequate, was sufficient to make the approach. And here's something I had never done. I've known a lot about God. I've known several things, but until 1994, I had never affected a contact with him. This happened to me first through the ceremonial sweat lodge. My native elders took me to, and I tell you, there I experienced an effective contact with God because, see, I was always taught I could never approach God. He was too holy for all that. But this book here says no. My experience shows now that that's not true. Those were my thoughts telling me that. As soon as we admitted the possibility of the existence, now let's look at these spiritual terms because we're fixing to look at it. Here's one. Creative intelligent. Here's another. Spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. We begin to be possessed by a new sense of power and direction. Damn, I'm going to be possessed by something other than my head. Yeah, I'm ready for this. But there's a condition, and here it is, provided we took the other simple steps. So if I don't take these other simple steps, then I'm not going to have this. And if I do, it ain't going to last very long. We found that God does not make too hard a terms of those that seek him. <clears throat> I never felt that way growing up in, in the church. Thus, the realm of the spirit, there's another spiritual term. It's broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive, or forbidding to those who earnestly sleep. seek. We believe it is open to all men. This is going to be our second exercise on page 47, and we're going to look at the spiritual terms exercise. Now, this is something that I had never done in 25 years prior to going through this work in 2019. No one ever told me this was an exercise. We just read through that, thought it was some cool shit to look at. Comes to find out there's some action here, and I didn't know it. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. Now, this applies to the other spiritual expressions, which you find in this book, do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. At the start, this is all we need to commence spiritual growth. <clears throat> My sponsor had me to take a sheet of notebook paper, draw straight down the middle, and look at this exercise. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms. He said, I want you to prayerfully ask God to show you what spiritual terms block you from his presence. Just the terms. And then, like it says here, I want you to ask yourself what they honestly mean to you. Don't go to Webster's Dictionary and look that up. <clears throat> I want you to honestly ask yourself what these mean to you. But on the left side... I'm going to look at my prejudice, which, remember, is preconceived ideas, and I'm prayerfully going to ask what they are. For me, it looked like this, because I was such rebellious of the church. Mine started with Christ, the Holy Spirit, ceremony, salvation, eternity, death, hereafter, only son, and that's just a few. I could probably load that whole thing up. Now, these are just terms. And I'm so cut off from these because of my attitude toward them that I ain't even willing to listen to nobody. You start talking about Jesus, man, get back, get back. I'm going to hurt you. I should have listened. Here's what I found out through this. And I thought that I hated Jesus Christ. God Almighty, I didn't hate him. What I hated was the way they presented him to me. Their idea that they told me I must believe and I couldn't believe it. I can't believe that. I mean, I've got a son. If he walked out on the playground and, God forbid, he shot half a dozen kids dead, I promise you I ain't going to quit loving him any more than I do today. I might not like what he's done, but I'm not going to condemn him to death and hell for that. There ain't no way. And if that's me, an alcoholic, 
how much greater can God be than that? So it's not about Christ. It was about what I felt. I thought that had to change. And guess what? That changed. Here's what it meant to me at the time. It meant punishment and death. Because remember, he's crucified. Today, the message for me is more about the resurrection of life. Ain't that what happened to everybody sitting around these tables right here? Mm -hmm. Haven't we all moved to a higher level of existence? Damn sure. Wow, I don't think that way no more. Therefore, I don't resent this no more. What happened? My experience changes. Holy Spirit, he's a watcher. He's judging me all the time. You know who was watching and doing the judging? Everything we read about in the first three chapters called self. Wow. I had this completely backwards. So this is a very, very powerful exercise here. Don't miss out on this. If you haven't done this, please do. Because I'm telling you, if you come from this prayerfully, it will change your life. I've had people come up with these old ideas and we'll sit down and we'll read through that after they get finished. And I ask them, do you really believe that? Do you really, really in your heart, put aside self, in your heart, do you believe that? And they're like, no, I don't believe that. Then get rid of that shit. You don't have to have that. And they're like, oh, my God. And you just start to see that shell just start cracking. And guess what comes out? The spirit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, now it's the good stuff, you know. So it says... Look at what he says. Do not let any spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you at the start. He words, at the start, this was all we needed to commence spiritual growth. That's all I need. To affect our first conscious relation as we understood him. Afterwards, now this is today for me, we found ourselves accepting many things on faith, which then seemed entirely out of reach. I could not accept that in 2019. There's no way. For 25 years, I never accepted that. But it says that was growth, and if we wish to grow, that should be a question mark there. Do I wish to grow? And if so, then I'm going to have to begin somewhere. So I'm going to use my own conception, however limited it was, because this is going to give me a different conception of a power greater than self. We need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe? Hell, the agnostic, he believes. He believes in the existence of God. He just believes, He doesn't believe it works for him. So if you would write agnostic above that, do I now believe? Or even will, willing to believe, that's the atheist. That there is a power greater than self. As soon as a man can say that he does believe, that's the agnostic. Or he's even willing to believe, that's the atheist. We emphatically assure him he's on his way. It's been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. My God, how crazy in the mind have I been? I have been asleep behind the wheel for 25 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, running around, speaking everywhere, doing all these book studies, all this, that. Didn't even have a clue what this book was asking me to do. I'm glad for what happened to me in 2019. I am. I hate the people I hurt, but I'm glad for what happened to me because it drove me to an emotional bottom that I had nowhere to look straight up. And had I not went through this work in the way I did, I'd be a dead man today. There ain't no doubt in my mind about it. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. So remember, it also describes some spiritual terms at the bottom of 46 that you could look at as well. Creative intelligence, spirit of the universe, uh, God, all that stuff, realm of the spirit. So <clears throat> I want to take a look here. There's so much here. And time ain't going to prevent it, permit us to do it. I really hope you guys will go and, and look at the YouTube because, you know, there I did it once a week for many weeks, and it's, it's more sentence by sentence by sentence. But here we don't have time to do that. So let's take a trip over to page 50 of the book. And, and I hate to jump that far, but for time's sake, we're going to have to. Second to the last paragraph says this. On one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them. Damn, what a promise. Not a few of them. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than himself. See, it's more than just a belief. I need to gain access here. This power has, in each case, accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. 
as a celebrated American statesman once put or, or put it, that's John D. Rockefeller. Let's look at the record. <clears throat> now, here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. Every one of us sitting in here are that way. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, step two, take a certain attitude toward that power, that's step three, do certain simple things, that's steps four through 12. Now, if we will do this wholeheartedly, look at what the results of this is. There has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking, keyword. And said much about drinking here, have we? <laughs> That's not what needs to change. That's already changed by now at this point in the book. In the face of collapse and despair, that's step one. That's the first half of step one. In the face of the total failure of their human resources, that's the second half of step one. My life has become unmanageable. Look at what happens. We find a new peace, power, power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into me. Self is beginning to be removed out of the way. I'm no longer really believe in the shit that once was killing me. I'm not taking actions based on those things because I don't believe those things anymore. When they show up in the mind, I say, no, 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 it ain't true. It tells me you're not good enough to, to for God. It tells me you're broken. You're damaged. Yeah, that's okay. I'm healing. I'm healing. But look what it says. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. That's steps three through 12. Once confused and baffled by the seemingly futility of existence, they show the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. Leaving aside the drink question. If I ask you that question, leave aside the drink, drug, lust, whatever it is, Leave aside that question. Tell me why you was making such a heavy going out of life. You probably couldn't tell me because, hell, we don't know. I didn't know my thoughts were beating me up. I didn't know that. I mean, I, I, every now and again, I get a glimpse of that. But I don't know that. But it says they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. That's the second half of step one. My life is unmanageable. They show how the change come over them. And if I can't do that in Alcoholics Anonymous through the work in this book, I sure as hell don't need to sit down in a meeting and be trying to tell you how to do it. If I can't show you through this book how to work these steps, or someone can't show that to me, they don't need to be coming to me because I ain't got no time for that at all. When many hundreds of people are able to say that today, the consciousness, keyword, of the presence of God is today the most important fact of their life, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. And that's powerful. Go to page 52. But in most fields, our generation has witnessed complete liberation of our thinking. How many people would like that? I promise you. <laughs> I want complete liberation of my thinking. My head says, is that even possible? Can you really do that? Well, I got to look at where them thoughts are coming from. Show any longshoresman a Sunday supplement describing the proposed the moon and the rocket. And he'll say, I bet they do it. Maybe it's not so long. Hell, I didn't even know what a longshoresman was. I've been in here 25 years. I don't even know what a longshoresman was. I never took no time to stop and look that up. It's a rugged, roughneck kind of a dude that works on the on the docks, and he's just closed-minded, and he's rough, you know. That's what a longshoresman is. And he don't believe very easily. And a Sunday supplement was a newspaper that was – presented back in those days. So it says, show any longshoresman a Sunday supplement describing a proposal to the moon by means of a rocket. And he'll say, I bet they do it. Maybe not so long either. But I'm the kind of guy that says, oh, shit, that won't ever happen. That'd be like me telling my brother Matt over there, man, I'm going to jump in my pickup, and I'm going to be back in Oklahoma in about 30 minutes, and I'll be back down here in an hour, and we'll pick up on this again. He'd look at me like you're crazier than hell. I mean, you, what, what are you on this morning? And that's kind of how it was here. They're, they're thinking, no, this can't happen. And see, really what this is telling us, if we limit our ideas when it comes to this power just because of what we've heard growing up as a kid, then we really miss out on the freedom that's going to come from this experience. Look at what he says. Is not our age characterized by the ease with which we discard keywords here? Old ideas for new, that's what we're going to do through this process. By the complete readiness with which we throw away a theory or gadget which does not work for something new that does. 
If that phone quits working, you're going to try to fix it. If that computer tears up or your vehicle, you're going to try to get it fixed. But if you can't get it fixed, what are you going to do? You're going to throw it away. You're going to get something different that works. Or I am. Why can't I do that with my conception of God? Because what I was taught as a kid, if you ever try to do that, <laughs> guess where you're going one of these days? And I believe that. And I stayed scared and I stayed away from all that kind of stuff. I ain't afraid like that no more. I am a free man today when it comes to that. I have walked beyond those beliefs and I tell them preachers all the time, I love you and I respect your beliefs, but I don't believe it. I've sat down and had lunch and they've got up and give me a hug and they said, man, you give me a lot of stuff to chew on here today. <laughs> I promise you. And it's like, you know what? The realm of the spirit is broad and roomy, all exclusive or never exclusive to those who earnestly seek. And that's what we're doing here. I'm going to throw away an old idea and that old idea about Jesus Christ didn't work. And when I threw it away, that new idea came in and you know what? That idea works. <laughs> I'll be damned. Imagine that. So it's crazy, isn't it? We have to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems. There it is. The same readiness to change our point of view. Same as we did in step one. Now, this is called the bedevilments exercise. So when I read a guy to here, we're going to do that. <clears throat> and we're going to look at nine questions here. He's going to have to write about these the same way he did spiritual terms. <clears throat> look at the first question. We were having problems with personal relationships. Anybody other than me and sobriety have problems with personal relationships? Let's start with our personal relationship with God. How about that one? Now, let's look at ourselves. Then let's look at our brothers and sisters. And then let's look at our coworkers. And then let's look at our personal relationships all together. Where we're having problems. I'm going to have that guy write about that. Prayerfully. Prayerfully. Because if I don't, self will start writing exercise. Look at the next question. We can control our emotional natures. Anybody other than me had problems with that? Sobriety? He's going to write about that. We were a prey. Oh, my God. One of the few times this book, if not the only time, it's ever going to tell me that I'm a prey. I always thought I was a creditor. That's what I thought. I run around even admitting to it. Shit, I'm not the prey. I'm being preyed upon by something in my head, and it's telling me what to do, and I'm doing it, thinking it's me doing it. I'm accountable because I took these actions. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I'm not the one that directed those thoughts. Self did. And when I seen that, I was able to forgive David. I was like, wow, I just got to not think that way no more. God help me, God help me, God help me. And that's how we started doing it. So we're going to write about that. We're a prey. We were a prey. The misery and depression. We're going to write about this and we couldn't make a living. I told him that's a lie. I make six figures a year. He said, you spend a lot of time on that phone and computer, don't you? I said, I do. He said, ain't real good stuff you're looking at on there is no he said you're the only one that shares that phone plan no he said does that take you away from your work are you able to focus on your job 100 <laughs> percent no he said right about not being able to make a living jesus i didn't know he wanted to go that deep with all of it you know but we had a feeling key word this comes from self of uselessness we're going to write about that we're full of fear we're going to write about that and we were unhappy. We're going to write about that. And if you'll do that purple, I promise you, things are going to change. Just a quick look at mine. I want to look at the trouble I was having before, and I want to look at what that would look like now with recovered eyes. So I was having personal with trouble with personal relationships how well i lie and, lie and cheat to get what i want what's that look like for me today i seek to give rather than to get i wouldn't be here this weekend if it wasn't for that i promise you i try to give to my fellow man today rather than to take from him how did i control my emotional natures i tried to numb it loneliness this that you know i mean we sober up some of us go to food some go to love some go to depression some work all the time. Today, I ask God to remove those fears. <clears throat> How was I afraid of misery? There again, I try to numb loneliness. What do I do today? What does that look like today? I ask for help. I ask others. I ask you guys for help. I'm accountable to you. 
How was I afraid and misery to depression? I can't say no to the voice or my needs. I can't say no or voice my needs. Today, I thank God for what I have instead of what I want. And as I move on down through this, this is a very powerful exercise. So please, I mean, if you haven't done this, consider it because it's life changing, I promise you. All right, bottom paragraph. <clears throat> when we saw others solve their problem by simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, there's another spiritual term. We had to stop doubting the power of God. See, I don't doubt God so much as I doubt the power of God. That won't work for me. That's what self tells me. That won't work for me. That's too much work. Listen to everything he's talking about up there. You can't do all that. Who's got time for all that, man? We got to work. We got a family to take care of. We got this. Got. I promise you, I better find some time to take care of it because it's been my experience. If I don't, then it ain't gonna turn out very good. I ain't gonna have all that to worry about. So, all right, middle of the page, fifty-three. When we became alcoholics, see, I hear people coming and they say, "David, I was born alcoholic." I don't care if he was or not. My book don't say that. It said when we became it. It didn't say when you was born alcoholic. It says when you became alcoholic, crushed by self-imposed crisis. Now, see, I always thought that I was the one who crushed. I crushed and all this. I thought just talking about me. But notice that S has a little, or that self has a little S in front of it. That's an imposition of self. See, I was traumatized as a young boy by a stepdad and three or four stepbrothers. And the thought came into my mind that day, there ain't no one ever going to hurt you like that again or we're, we're going to kill him. That's a pretty damn good idea. <laughs> that was self-talking to me, only I didn't know it. And so I began to grow with that idea until the day that I took that man's life. Wow. Crushed by the imposition of self. See, self is what imposed that crisis upon me. I didn't know how to handle that type of thinking as a, as a boy. I felt dirty and I felt shameful for something I didn't have any power to stop. I got to drink. I got to drink to get over that. I got to drug. I don't, I got to get away from that kind of thinking. So I become an alcoholic as a result of this self-imposed crisis. I didn't impose it, self did. I'm not the self. We could not postpone or evade. I can't run to West Texas and, and put it off for a couple of weeks and then go back. You know, I, I can't evade it. I fearlessly got to face the proposition that God either everything or he's nothing. God either is or he isn't. What's our choice to be? Now, if I asked you what your choice to that to be would be today, you'd probably say the same as I did to my sponsor when he took me through this. I said, God is everything. And he said, what about them days you're crazy as hell running around with all them women? What was God that day? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> Why are we talking about that day? He said, because you're probably going to be that way tomorrow unless you have an experience there. <clears throat> so the moral of that story is this. That choice is on the daily. It's not something I choose as I go through this work and say, okay, that's all done. No, I better be looking at this choice daily. Either God is everything or else he is nothing. Either he is or he isn't. What is my choice to be? And if I don't choose this, and page 24 tells me what my choice is going to be. Self is going to choose alcohol for me, and I'm going to follow its directions. So arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason. Look at that capital R with reason. Now that's talking about self. We always like to reason stuff out, don't we? Toward the desired shore phase. Now, the outline and the promises of the new land. Now, he's talking about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous here. And look at this closely and tell me if this wasn't your experience. The new land had brought luxury to tired eyes and fresh courage, flag, and spirits. I walked into meetings with the flag up, so to speak. It was like, all right, man, I'm done. I quit. I'm good. Friendly hands stretched out and welcome. Ain't that what these brothers and sisters did for you when you came here? Did they reach out with their hand? They give you a hug? They welcome? Glad you're here. But let's look how self's going to rob us of that. We were grateful with reason, capital R, had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. I can't come all the way in here. I can't sit all the way down. I can't work all these steps. I can't trust you. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And this is what my head keeps telling me that last mile. I don't want to lose my support. But look at here what it says. That was natural. 
But let us think a little more closely without knowing it. Key words right here. I don't even know this shit's happening to me. I don't know it. I can't be responsible for what I don't know. Once I know, I know. But then I didn't know. So without knowing it, had I not been brought to where I stood by a certain kind of faith, I always thought that was talking about faith in God. No, I'd been brought to where I stood in 2019 by a certain kind of faith because my faith was channeled in self. And I didn't know it. <laughs> by God, I know it now. And so I can remember telling Miss Patty, I'm not responsible for what I've done, but I'm accountable. And she was reading a book. And she threw that book on the table and said, is that right? Is that right? So you mean to tell me that wasn't you that was laid up doing all that stuff? And I said, yeah, it was. I said, but I promise you, I didn't wake up that morning thinking that's what I'm going to do today. Somewhere in the day, that thought jumped in my head. And it, I didn't know to turn. I just kept going through my day. And that thought got bigger and bigger. And I took action based on that thought. And it created a reality. And I'm not responsible for those thoughts, but I'm damn sure responsible for the actions of those thoughts. Now I know. And it was just like, she said, don't you ever tell a newcomer that. As long as you live, don't tell a newcomer that. I'm like, bullshit. I'm telling every newcomer I know about it. And so it's been ever since. And we've not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith. Did we not believe in our own reasoning? Top 54. Do we not have confidence in our ability to think that self? That's not God. What is that but a sort of faith? See, I had faith the whole time. It was just channeled in the wrong direction. Yes, we have been faithfully objectable, objectively faithful to the God of reason, capital R. See, self has become my God, and I don't even know it. It tells me how to think. It tells me what to do. It tells me where to go. It tells me when to pray. It tells me to do this. And hell, I do it. I don't know any different. Uh, I feel I'm connected to God. But why are my actions not showing that? <laughs> wow. Big difference there. Well, we found two. Well, it says we, we discovered that faith's been involved all the time. We found two. We've been worshipers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. How many of us have variously worshipped people? Anybody ever do that? Your sponsor, the preacher, the counselor, anybody, your wife, your husband, whoever. What about sentiment? Things, money, self? What about that? Anybody ever worship any of that other than me? Don't even know we're doing it? Then with a better motive, have we not worshipfully beheld the sunset, sea, or flower? Who of us have not loved something, somebody? How much did these, look? these key words right here, these feelings, these loves, these worships have to do with pure reason. In other words, God-centeredness. Hell, little or nothing, I saw it last. Finally, 25 years later. God, look how important these words are right here. Were these things the tissues which our lives were constructed? And did not these feelings, after all, determine the course of my existence? And that's exactly what it done. It determined the course of my existence. And I followed it. How the hell can I be responsible for that if I don't know? Wow. You talk about waking up in a big way. I started having a spiritual experience with this man through this book. And I'm like, holy shit. I've been reading and studying and presenting this book for 25 years. What do I do now? He said, present it differently. Tell the damn truth based on your story. Quit being ashamed of getting up there and talking about what happened to you. Get up and tell the truth. Shit. <laughs> and he's like, you're going to get a chance to do that. I want you to come over to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and do a conference. I'm like, hell no. No. It's like, <laughs> that's the wrong answer for sure. And so I went and did it, and that was my first time back in two and a half years to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, man, to stand up there and talk about that, uh But I tell you what, it went well, <clears throat> and so it has been ever since. Some of you heard me over in Denver City, and I didn't hold back on that for a minute. Because a lot of people suffer from that inside Alcoholics Anonymous. They will never step up to the plate because they're afraid of judgment, and shame, and guilt. Page 55. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental key word here. Idea of God. It may be blocked by calamity, pomp, worship of other things. Sex, money, drugs, alcohol, whatever. 
But in some form or another, it's there for faith and power greater than self and miraculous demonstration that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of a God was part of our makeup. My God, i never seen that sentence before. You mean God is a part of my mate? Well, hell yeah. I mean, he created you. I mean, how could he not be a part of it? Just as much as we had the feeling for a friend. I got friends in here I'd take a bullet for. I promise you I would. And they would me. If I can love you that much and you love me, how much greater love can all of this be? That's, that's powerful, man. We finally saw that God, we finally saw, my God, 25 years later, <laughs> I finally saw. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. There's that fourth step. But he was there. So that tells me right there, once we move through four, boom, there he is. My mouth is not blocked off by all the crap anymore. Is as much a fact as we were. We found a great reality deep down within. That's why I can't ever make contact with him. All this surface stuff is killing me. All of these thoughts are driving me to do crazy stuff. Even while I'm sober, I'm disconnected. I feel, I don't feel right with God. Even if I'm not doing a lot of the things that I used to do, I still don't feel like I'm connected to this power. Why? <clears throat> When's the last time any of us really ever did a thorough inventory the way this book calls for? Remember back on page 25, it says that's what that's the successful consummation. We found the great reality deep down within in the last analysis. After I've analyzed everything else, it's only there that he gave me found it. So with us, we can only clear the ground a bit. But if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to keyword here, think honestly. I'm not thinking the same way I used to. I'm not believing the lie anymore. I'm thinking honestly now. Encourages you to search diligently within yourself. There's that fourth step again. He keeps coming back to that. He's saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because <laughs> we're going there. Then if you wish, you can join us on Broad Highway. And with this attitude, you cannot fail. One of the more beautiful sentences in this book, the consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Emmett Fox says, be careful the God you pick because that's the one you get. If I believe in hell and judgment and all this and this and this, that's the way I'm going to treat everybody on the outside of me. But if I believe in a God of love and compassion and joy and understanding, that's how I'm going to treat you. And that's how you're going to treat me or I'm not going to be around you. And that's just the way it is. So in this book, you will read the experience of a man who thought, keyword, thought he was an atheist. Hell, he wasn't one. He just thought he was. The story is so interesting. Some of it should be told now. If you ever want to read that story in the fourth edition, it is on page 497 or 208. 497, I think it was in the third edition. 208 in the fourth edition and that this story is told there so his change of heart was dramatic convincing and moving it goes on to talk about he was a minister's son but if you'll drop on down past the second paragraph there one night he asked himself this question after the sentence above said like a thunderbolt a great thought came in see that's where this power is it's in those thoughts page 23 we looked at earlier said the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind so does the solution. So does the solution. Because once the mind is healed, the spirit begins to feed it and feed it and feed it. But as long as I block that out, self, <clears throat> then I'm not experiencing that presence. So if I'm not experiencing that, that's something I need to look at. He says, who are you to say there is no God? This man recounts, he tumbled out of bed in his knees. In a few seconds, he was overwhelmed by the conviction of the presence of God. That don't have anything to do with not drinking anymore. I mean, no. It poured over and it threw him with a certain and majestic majesty of a great tide of flood. The barriers, we're talking about those prejudices within the mind, he had built through the years were swept away. They were gone. So, I mean, it was gone. This is what the book talks about, the sudden revolutionary spiritual experiences. Boom. I mean, they hit like that. Most of us don't have those. But look at when, when that happened. Look at his experience. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. He has stepped from the bridge of reason to the shore of faith. For the first time, he lived in conscious companionship with his creator. And that has been my experience since 2019. Have I made a lot of mistakes? You bet. Can I admit them today? Tell you all about them? You bet. Could I have done that before? Hell no. <laughs> no. Thus, our friend's cornerstone was fixed in place. No later vicissitude of shaking it. His alcoholic problem was taken away that very night years ago. 
it disappeared. <clears throat> Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought, key word, the thought of drink has never returned. At such times, a great revulsion has risen up, look at this one word, in him. That's where it's at. I kept looking for it out here. Seemingly, he could not drink, even if he would. God had restored his sanity. He doesn't think the same way anymore. Self's not running the show. What is this but a miracle of healing? Yeah, being sober is just one part of that. Yet its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing. That's step one. To believe. That's step two. He humbly offered himself to his maker. That's step three. And then he knew. Now, I don't know what this man knew, but I know what I knew at this point, that we were getting ready to write some inventory. <laughs> Even so, God has restored us all. Look at those two words, us all. Damn. God, I needed to see that. To our right minds. This man, the revelation was sudden. Some of us growing to it more slowly. But he has come to all, and here's the condition. <clears throat> who have honestly sought him. When we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. See, I didn't find God. I hear that all the time. I came day and found God. I didn't find God. I didn't do that. When I disclosed self to him through this process, going through inventory and the rest of these steps, look at that. When I drew near to him through this process, hell, he disclosed himself to me. I didn't have to go find him. He was there. My thinking's not the same anymore. That's where the power's at. I kept thinking God's another entity. Hell, he's an elderly gentleman with a long beard and a cane and a clipboard, and he's keeping score. And I, I mean, this is how my head thinks. No, no. Infinite power and love comes from within. Wow, what a concept. <clears throat> Look at the first question. We were having problems with personal relationships. Anybody other than me and sobriety have problems with personal relationships? Let's start with our personal relationship with God. How about that one? And then let's look at ourselves. Then let's look at our brothers and sisters. And then let's look at our coworkers. And then let's look at our personal relationships altogether. Where we're having problems. I'm gonna have that guy write about that. Prayerfully. Prayerfully. Because if I don't self will start writing the exercise. Look at the next question. We can control our emotional natures. Anybody other than me had problems with that sobriety? He's going to write about that. We were a prey. Oh, my God. One of the few times this book, if not the only time, it's ever going to tell me that I'm a prey. I always thought I was a predator. That's what I thought. I run around even admitting to it. Shit, I'm not the prey. I'm being preyed upon by something in my head, and it's telling me what to do, and I'm doing it, thinking it's me doing it. I'm accountable because I took these actions. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I'm not the one that directed those thoughts. Self did. And when I seen that, I was able to forgive David. I was like, wow. I just got to not think that way no more. God help me. God help me. God help me. And that's how we started doing it. So we're going to write about that. We're a prey. We were a prey. The misery and depression. We're going to write about this, and we couldn't make a living. I told him, that's a lie. I make six figures a year. He said, you spend a lot of time on that phone and computer, don't you? I said, I do. He said, ain't real good stuff you're looking at on there, is it? No. He said, you're the only one that shares that phone plan? I said, no. He said, does that take you away from your work? Are you able to focus on your job 100%? <laughs> no. He said, write about not being able to make a living. Jesus. I didn't know he wanted to go that deep with all of it, you know. But we had a feeling, key word, this comes from self, of uselessness. We're going to write about that. We're full of fear. We're going to write about that. And we were unhappy. We're going to write about that. And if you'll do that prayerfully, I promise you, things are going to change. Just a quick look at mine. I want to look at the trouble I was having before, and I want to look at what that would look like now with recovered eyes. So I was having personal with trouble with personal relationships. How? Well, I lie, lie and cheat to get what I want. What's that look like for me today? I seek to give rather than to get. I wouldn't be here this weekend if it wasn't for that. I promise you. 
I try to give to my fellow man today rather than to take from him. How did I control my emotional natures? I tried to numb it. Loneliness, this, that. You know, I mean, we sober up. Some of us go to food. Some go to love. Some go to depression. Some work all the time. Today, I ask God to remove those fears. <clears throat> How was I prey to misery? There again, I try to numb loneliness. What do I do today? What does that look like today? I ask for help. I ask others. I ask you guys for help. I'm accountable to you. How was I prey to misery to depression? I can't say no to the voice or my needs. I can't say no or voice my needs. Today, I thank God for what I have instead of what I want. And as I move on down through this, this is a very powerful exercise. So please, I mean, if you haven't done this, consider it because it's life changing, I promise you. All right, bottom paragraph. <clears throat> when we saw others solve their problem by simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, there's another spiritual term. We had to stop doubting the power of God. See, I don't doubt God so much as I doubt the power of God. That won't work for me. That's what self tells me. That won't work for me. That's too much work. Listen to everything he's talking about up there. You can't do all that. Who, who's got time for all that, man? We got to work. We got a family to take care of. We got this. We got. I promise you, I better find some time to take care of it because it's been my experience. If I don't, then it ain't going to turn out very good. I ain't going to have all that to worry about. So, all right, middle of the page 53. When we became alcoholics, see, I hear people come and they say, David, I was born alcoholic. I don't care if he was or not. My book don't say that. It said when we became it. It didn't say when you was born alcoholic. It says when you became alcoholic, crushed by self-imposed crisis. Now, see, I always thought that I was the one who crushed. I crushed and all this. I thought just talking about me. But notice that S has a little, or that self has a little S in front of it. That's an imposition of self. See, I was traumatized as a young boy by a stepdad and three or four stepbrothers. And the thought came into my mind that day, there ain't no one ever gonna hurt you like that again or we're, or we're gonna kill him. That's a pretty damn good idea. <laughs> that was self talking to me, only I didn't know it. And so I began to grow with that idea until the day that I took that man's life. Wow. Crushed by the imposition of self. See, self is what imposed that crisis upon me. I didn't know how to handle that type of thinking as a, as a boy. I felt dirty and I felt shameful for something I didn't have any power to stop. I got to drink. I got to drink to get over that. I got to drug. I don't, I got to get away from that kind of thinking. So I become an alcoholic as a result of this self-imposed crisis. I didn't impose it. Self did. I'm not the self. We could not postpone or evade. I can't run to West Texas and, and put it off for a couple of weeks and then go back. You know, I, I can't evade it. I fearlessly got to face the proposition that God either everything or he's nothing. God either is or he isn't. What's our choice to be? Now, if I ask you what your choice to that to be would be today, you'd probably say the same as I did to my sponsor when he took me through this. I said, God is everything. And he said, what about them days you're crazy as hell running around with all them women? What was God that day? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> Why are we talking about that day? He said, because you're probably going to be that way tomorrow unless you have an experience there. <clears throat> so the moral of that story is this. That choice is on the day. It's not something I choose as I go through this work and say, okay, that's all done. No, I better be looking at this choice daily. Either God is everything or else he is nothing. Either he is or he isn't. What is my choice to be? And if I don't choose this, then page 24 tells me what my choice is going to be. Self is going to choose alcohol for me, and I'm going to follow its directions. So arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason. Look at that capital R with reason. Uh, that's talking about self. We always like to reason stuff out, don't we? Toward the desired sure phase. Now, the outline and the promises of the new land. Now, he's talking about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous here. And look at this closely and tell me if this wasn't your experience. The new land had brought luxury to tired eyes and fresh courage, flag, and spirits. I walked into meetings with the flag up, so to speak. It was like, all right, man, I'm done. I quit. I'm good. 
friendly hand stretched out and welcome. Ain't that what these brothers and sisters did for you when you came here? Did they reach out with their hand? They give you a hug, they welcome. Glad you're here. <clears throat> but let's look how self's going to rob us of that. We were grateful with reason, capital R, had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. I can't come all the way in here. I can't sit all the way down. I can't work all these steps. I can't trust you. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't. And this is what my head keeps telling me that last mile. I don't want to lose my support. But look at here what it says. That was natural. But let us think a little more closely without knowing it. Key words right here. I don't even know this shit's happening to me. I don't know it. I can't be responsible for what I don't know. Once I know, I know. But then I didn't know. So without knowing it, had I not been brought to where I stood by a certain kind of faith, I always thought that was talking about faith in God. No, I'd been brought to where I stood in 2019 by a certain kind of faith because my faith was channeled in self. And I didn't know it. <laughs> by God, I know it now. And so I can remember telling Miss Patty, I'm not responsible for what I've done, but I'm accountable. And she was reading a book. And she threw that book on the table and said, is that right? Is that right? So you mean to tell me that wasn't you that was laid up doing all that stuff? And I said, yeah, it was. I said, but I promise you, I didn't wake up that morning thinking that's what I'm going to do today. Somewhere in the day, that thought jumped in my head. And it, I didn't know to turn. I just kept going through my day. And that thought got bigger and bigger. And I took action based on that thought, and it created a reality. And I'm not responsible for those thoughts, but I'm damn sure responsible for the actions of those thoughts. Now I know. And it was just like, she said, don't you ever tell a newcomer that. As long as you live, don't tell a newcomer that. I'm like, bullshit. I'm telling every newcomer I know about it. And so it's been ever since. Have we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? Did we not believe in our own reasoning? Top 54. Do we not have confidence in our ability to think that self? That's not God. What is that but a sort of faith? See, I had faith the whole time. It was just channeling in the wrong direction. Yes, we have been faithfully objectable, objectively faithful to the God of reason, capital R. See, self has become my God, and I don't even know it. It tells me how to think. It tells me what to do. It tells me where to go. It tells me when to pray. It tells me to do this. And hell, I do it. I don't know any different. Uh, I feel I'm connected to God, but why are my actions not showing that? <laughs> wow. Big difference there. Well, we found two. Well, it says we, we discovered that faith's been involved all the time. We found two we'd been worshipers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. How many of us had variously worshiped people? Anybody ever do that? Your sponsor, the preacher, the counselor, anybody your wife, your husband, whoever. What about sentiment? Things, money, self, what about that? Anybody ever worship any of that other than me? Don't even know we're doing it? Then with a better motive, have we not worshipfully beheld the sunset, sea, or flower? Who of us have not loved something, somebody? How much did these, look at these key words right here, these feelings, these loves, these worships have to do with pure reason? In other words, God-centeredness? Hell, little or nothing, I saw it last. Finally, 25 years later. God, look how important these words are right here. Were these things the tissues which our lives were constructed? And did not these feelings, after all, determine the course of my existence? And that's exactly what it done. It determined the course of my existence, and I followed it. How the hell can I be responsible for that if I don't know? Wow. You talk about waking up in a big way. I started having a spiritual experience with this man through this book, and I'm like, holy shit. I've been reading and studying and presenting this book for 25 years. What do I do now? He said, present it differently. Tell the damn truth based on your story. Quit being ashamed of getting up there and talking about what happened to you. Get up and tell the truth. Shit. <laughs> and he's like, you're going to get a chance to do that. I want you to come over to Cedar Rapids. I wouldn't do a conference. I'm like, hell no. No. He's like, that's the wrong answer for sure. And so I went and did it. And that was my first time back in two and a half years to Alcoholics Anonymous, and man, 
to stand up there and talk about that. Uh, but I tell you what, it went well, <clears throat> and so it has been ever since. Some of you heard me over in Denver City, and I didn't hold back on that for a minute because a lot of people suffer from that inside Alcoholics Anonymous. They will never step up to the plate because they're afraid of judgment, and shame, and guilt. Page 55. Actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental key word here, idea of God. It may be blocked by calamity, pomp, worship of other things, sex, money, drugs, alcohol, whatever. But in some form or another, it's there for faith and power greater than self and miraculous demonstration of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of a God was part of our makeup. My God, i never seen that sentence before. You mean God is a part of my mate? Well, hell yeah. I mean, he created you. I mean, how could he not be a part of it? Just as much as we had the feeling for a friend. I got friends in here I'd take a bullet for. I promise you I would. And they would me. If I can love you that much and you love me, how much greater love can all of this be? That's, that's powerful, man. We finally saw that God, we finally saw, my God, 25 years later, <laughs> I finally saw. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly. There's that fourth step. But he was there. So that tells me right there, once we move through four, boom, there he is. I'm not, it's not blocked off by all the crap anymore. Is as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within. That's why I can't ever make contact with him. All this surface stuff is killing me. All of these thoughts are driving me to do crazy stuff. Even while I'm sober, I'm disconnected. I feel I don't feel right with God. Even if I'm not doing a lot of the things that I used to do, I still don't feel like I'm connected to this power. Why? When's the last time any of us really ever did a thorough inventory the way this book calls for? Remember back on page 25, it says that's what that's the successful consummation. We found the great reality deep down within in the last analysis. After I've analyzed everything else, it's only there that he gave me found it so with us. We can only clear the ground a bit, but if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to, keyword here, think honestly, I'm not thinking the same way I used to. I'm not believing the lie anymore. I'm thinking honestly now. Encourages you to search diligently within yourself. There's that fourth step again. He keeps coming back to that. He's saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because <laughs> we're going there. Then if you wish, you can join us on Broad Highway. And with this attitude, you cannot fail. One of the more beautiful sentences in this book, the consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Emmett Fox says, be careful the God you pick because that's the one you get. If I believe in hell and judgment and all this and this and this, that's the way I'm going to treat everybody on the outside of me. But if I believe in a God of love and compassion and joy and understanding, that's how I'm going to treat you. And that's how you're going to treat me or I'm not going to be around you. And that's just the way it is. So in this book, you will read the experience of a man who thought, keyword, thought he was a major. Hell, he wasn't one. He just thought he was. The story is so interesting, some of it should be told now. If you ever want to read that story in the fourth edition, it is on page 497. Or 208. 497, I think it was in the third edition, 208 in the fourth edition. And that this story is told there. So his change of heart was dramatic, convincing, and moving. It goes on to talk about he was a minister's son, but if you'll drop on down past the second paragraph there, and one night he asked himself this question after the sentence above said, like a thunderbolt, a great thought came in. See, that's where this power is. It's in those thoughts. Page 23, we looked at earlier, said the main problem, the alcoholic centers in his mind. So does the solution. So does the solution. Because once the mind is healed, the spirit begins to feed it and feed it and feed it. But as long as I block that out, self, <clears throat> then I'm not experiencing that presence. So if I'm not experiencing that, that's something I need to look at. He says, who are you to say there is no God? This man recounts, he tumbled out of bed in his knees. In a few seconds, he was overwhelmed by the conviction of the presence of God. That don't have anything to do with not drinking anymore. I mean, no. It poured over and threw him with a certain and majestic, majestic of a great tide of flood. The barriers, we're talking about those prejudices within the mind, he had built through the years were swept away. They were gone. So, I mean, it was gone. 
This is what the book talks about, the sudden revolutionary spiritual experiences. Boom. I mean, they hit like that. Most of us don't have those. But look at when, when that happened. Look at his experience. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. He has stepped from the bridge of reason to the shore of faith. For the first time, he lived in conscious companionship with his creator. And that has been my experience since 2019. Have I made a lot of mistakes? You bet. Can I admit them today? Tell you all about them? You bet. Could I have done that before? Hell no. <laughs> no. Thus, our friend's cornerstone was fixed in place. No later vicissitude has shaken it. His alcoholic problem was taken away that very night years ago. It disappeared. <clears throat> Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought, key word, the thought of drink has never returned. At such times, a great revulsion has risen up. Look at this one word, in him. That's where it's at. I kept looking for it out here. Seemingly, he could not drink, even if he would. God had restored his sanity. He doesn't think the same way anymore. Self's not running the show. What is this but a miracle of healing? Yeah, being sober is just one part of that. Yet its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing. That's step one. To believe. That's step two. He humbly offered himself to his maker. That's step three. And then he knew. Now, I don't know what this man knew, but I know what I knew at this point. That we were getting ready to write some inventory. <laughs> Even so, God has restored us all. Look at those two words, us all. Damn. God, I needed to see that. To our right mind. To this man, the revelation was sudden. Some of us growing to it more slowly. But he has come to all, and here's the condition, <coughs> who have honestly sought him. When we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. See, I didn't find God. I hear that all the time. I came day and found God. I didn't find God. I didn't do that. When I disclosed self to him through this process, going through inventory and the rest of these steps, look at that. When I drew near to him through this process, hell, he disclosed himself to me. I didn't have to go find him. He was there. My thinking's not the same anymore. That's where the power's at. I kept thinking God's another entity. Hell, he's an elderly gentleman with a long beard and a cane and a clipboard, and he's keeping score. And I, I mean, this is how my head thinks. No, no. Infinite power and love comes from within. Wow, what a concept. 